Got it. Face forward. Your slides are right there. You don't have to look at the slides. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Gusef, and the lead PI of the McMurdo Dry Valley's uh, LTER, and uh, this is a view of our site. This is uh, looking up Taylor Valley, and as you can see, we don't have a lot of vegetation at the surface. Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about in the context of particularly um, scaling is the, the legacies of the um, past glacial history in these valleys in this region. Um, as far as news goes, um, we did turn 30. We're very excited about that. Um, the, the McMurdo 6 renewal, we're told, is going to be um, uh, recommended for funding, but uh, there's some uh, internal issues we're sort of waiting on with respect to our operations notice and so forth. Um, we have five new co-PIs on, on the renewal, which is really awesome. A lot of new um, excitement and, and energy. Uh, it was a lot of fun to write this proposal with lots of new ideas. Um, and one of these, uh, Mark Salvatore is in the back here. He, he is attending this meeting. So if you get a chance, um, chat with him. And I wanted to note that uh, Merritt Tureski has been leading an effort to try to get the cold regions uh, LTERs to get together to put out a special issue of um, Arctic, Antarctic, and Alpine research. So, this, um, uh, so that's sort of in the works, but a number of other um, PIs from LTR sites have been involved. <clears throat> okay. Um, so if we look at Taylor Valley, looking down on this, this is a, a, a map that has been sort of originally written, drawn in by hand. And then we you know, were able to put uh, something digital behind this, this uh, imagery. But um, we look down and we think about what is going on with surface exposures. What, you know, there was a lot of glaciation in and out of this, this valley, in particular Taylor Valley here that we're looking at. And the glaciers are coming down from the mountains, I guess I, sh I should say. I think if I can use this. Um, these are ice covered lakes on the valley floor and then in this one as well. And then this is the East Antarctic ice sheet coming in um, on this, the left hand side of this, uh, this map. And these different um, uh, soils have different uh, nu nutrient content contents to them. So we have low phosphorus, for example, up valley here on the left. And on the right, we have McMurdo Sound at the very edge of this. We have a lot of phosphorus down in this region. And this is an area where the, the Ross ice shelf um, at, at one point butted up into the valley um, and caused a large lake and so forth. But we have a lot of phosphorus down in that valley. So in that end of the valley. So what does that mean? There's, there's a legacy here, which is to say that in the Ross Sea Tills, this sort of purple we have on the right, um, we have a lot of phosphorus for, uh, in our soil. And in the Taylorville, uh, Taylor 2 Tills in the up valley section, not quite as much. And the, the, the consequence to that, if we look at the um, phosphorus content of uh, two nematodes, Scott Nema and Plectus, we see much higher concentrations down valley um, and much lower concentrations up valley. So this is sort of the region we, we were just looking at this valley here, this is Taylor Valley, but we get the opportunity now to sort of regionalize and at least think about um, where these different deposits are and um, what, what consequences we have for um, uh, for, for life in our, in our region, but we've sort of moved beyond using just these static uh, glacial coverage maps, and we don't have a lot of rain, so we're not looking at sort of the connectivity of, of uh, hydrologically around this landscape in a broad sense, but we are thinking carefully about what happens um, in more focused regions. So I'm going to take us down to this little section here. This is the edge of the Canada Glacier on the left. Some maps will show up on the right. And then um, this, there's a meltwater stream that flows into uh, Lake Frixel here. And so this is some work that Mark has been doing, in particular pioneering, where we've been using remote sensing through the years, since about 2010, um, high resolution, one meter scale, and looking at the um, different spectra that come back and trying to assess, in this case, um, uh, algal mat coverage. So so not only are we sort of thinking about where the static locations of sort of these, these um, uh, stores of, of nutrients across the landscape, but now we can think about the dynamics of life on top of that. And so, for example, if we look at <clears throat> this particular image and look at the, uh, uh, we can map out the abundance of black mats, orange mats. So these are different algal mats that have um, signatures that are uh, unique in their, their wavelength um, uh, assessment. So... <clears throat> The other thing that I wanted to note is beyond space, we're also thinking about time with some of this imagery. Um, these are air temperature records from 2021 to 2022 um, in the austral summer and from five different locations across the valleys. And we have to leave the field at about this time, mid-February. But you can see that summer keeps going. We still have temperatures above freezing uh, into March in particular. But one of the curious things that happened last year, if you uh, notice the news, there was an atmospheric river that hit 
Antarctica. And there were a number of places that, that had these very high temperatures. On March 18th, we saw that happen in our record. So these are the, the sort of this punctuated warm spell, probably about 20 degrees higher Celsius than we should have been. And we did get above freezing in a few places, but we're not there. So we rely on remote sensing. So here is a view in particular of this Canada glacier, uh, sorry, Canada stream, glaciers on the left, lake is on the right. And you can see these little patches of blue indicating high gravimetric water content. And so that is suggesting that there was some meltwater during this event. But again, we're not there. So we have to think about using um, some of this scaling for, for time as well. Um, so I just note that one of the things that we've leaned on heavily is the Polar Geospatial Center at University of Minnesota and their funding from NSF to provide us with a lot of these opportunities. If you are interested in thinking about these opportunities for your site, come talk to me. I'm on their science advisory committee and we have a meeting in two weeks. Um, so I'd love to know if, if there's a, a great uh, argument for expanding PGC's um, uh, resources across the globe, not just the polls. Um, expertise, I think working with Mark and not only being able to look at the data, but process it in new ways has been fundamental to some of our success to this point. So with that, I'm done and I'll move on. Thanks so much. <laughs>